gentlemen, welcome to the Rin Grand Hotel, White Chair in Bucharest, Romania. This is the IMAP European Championships 2018, and you are joining us on day one. So without further ado, please welcome your first fighter into the cage, representing Austria, Franz Heinzel. In with the junior featherweight division here at the IMAFs and into the blue corner from Austria, Franz Heiseldeen making his way to the cage. Such a prestigious event to be at, Malcolm. The Olympics of MMA, the European Championships 2018 for Bucharest in Romania. Excited to be here. Oh, incredible stuff. And as we were discussing earlier, Dean, such a format for these amateurs, such a building block for them. It really is a tournament for the kind of prestigious athletes that want to catapult their careers in the MMA world. And this is the thing, the tournament situation, it's not just for any of these athletes about this one bout. It is in the moment, but they've also got one eye on the tournament situation. That's what makes the IMAF so exciting. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's a tournament of fashion. They've really got to make sure that they get the win decisively, um, but they've also got to look after their bodies. They've got to look after their, their kind of injuries, um, and they need to progress through this tournament, get to the final and get the gold. Yes, and an incredible setting here in Bucharest as Franz Heisel from Austria goes into that blue corner. And now, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome his opponent, representing Poland, Helik Walecki. So, our opening bout in this junior featherweight division sees Austria versus Poland as Eric Walecki makes his way to the red corner. And Dean, we were talking about the tournament situation. You've got the, the medicals, you've got the weigh-ins. There's a lot of stress on these athletes when they come here, starting yesterday before the big event today. So much going on in the background. Yeah, they've got to be really careful with, with kind of the injuries, the, the progression, the rest, um, the hydration. I mean, they've got some excellent teams behind. If, if looking behind the scenes, we've got the medics at on point, even the coaches. They've really got they've got all the kit together, you know, all the um, the isotonic drinks and everything. So they've really ticked all the boxes for their athletes to perform at their absolute best. And we talked about the level of competition. Everything is leading up here to this possibly becoming an Olympic sport. Yeah, they're looking to get this into the 2028 Olympics in LA. So, um, yeah, that's going to be a great one to go for. And they've got all the ingredients to go there. I mean, it's an exciting sport. It's blowing up in the scene right now, MMA. And I'd love to see this in the Olympics. And again, for all those watching, this will be the unified amateur rules, Dean, yes? Yeah, so um, there's no knees, no elbows, of course. Um, they've got the shin pads there, the, the, the big eight-ounce gloves. Um, so, yeah, they're going to they're gonna have to, um, to kind of work at this, um, Malcolm and... Uh, look to kind of finish early but I mean with the bigger gloves it's difficult to land those decisive uh, blows but I mean you might see a bit more jujitsu and wrestling here in this. Well, ladies and gentlemen this is a junior featherweight contest for the referee three rounds and in the blue corner representing Austria Franz Heinzel. <laughs> and his opponent fighting at the red corner representing Poland Herrick Balecki. So here we go, Dean Heinzel versus Vilecki here at Junior Featherweight Division. And Vilecki looks the slightly larger man at the weight. Vilecki coming out with a nice leg kick, and I love the way he just, just bounced out of range there from the counter from Heinzel. Well, as we were saying earlier, I mean, this is all about looking after yourself through what is potentially a tournament situation and working the inside and outside of Heinzel's leg there, Vilecki. And as you said, very sharp movement in and out. And they've got one eye on that next round, keeping yourself safe, getting in and out of there as quickly as possible. Heinz will now take and centre cage, and that could play a part here in the judges' scorecards. He's controlling the centre of the cage here. Now, Vilecki, as we said, moving. Oh, little left hook from Vilecki, and Heinzel has to be aware of that. We said he's very fast. He looks for me, as I said, the naturally bigger man at the weight, so would carry power if he really steps in with those punches. Nice, and catches the leg as Heinzel looks to counter here. 
but they can help with a nice body shot little slip there he does a great job of kind of using his footwork to dictate the shots and the exit movements there see there he was moving back as that that teep landed to his chest and didn't really get the full force of that kick due to his footwork now you mentioned the control of the center of the cage from Heinzel, but i feel he's also got to work a bit more dean that that teep was the most meaningful shot from him at the moment because although he's the more mobile valecki is also getting those shots in isn't he you can see from Heinz's stance as well he's a bit more upright it's kind of more of a looking for the the long strikes the big kicks the body kicks to really do damage and kind of work his way up there through the lower limbs and then go to the head with the strikes later on now i like Vilecki's style i've got to be honest he's very patient he's very mobile he's loose limbed and as you said he's got a nice variety of technique as well and comes in with that straight right hand so he's certainly the busier for me and it's a feeling out process we know the first round and as we said these young athletes they've got so much to think about within a tournament situation but i just feel that heinzel at the moment he's he's taking a risk by allowing this first round possibly to get away from him here he's taking a risk by leaving that teep out as well you can see that Vilecki caught that and instantly responded with the right hand so Heinzel needs to fire that teep out really fast and bring it back and then put some punches on the end of it to deter Vilecki coming back in well, what Vilecki is doing well is targeting that lead leg of Franz Heinzel whenever he can inside and outside moving staying safe and we mentioned in a tournament situation your personal safety how fit and strong you are for that potential next round is playing a part and for me thinking about that side of the game Vilecki fighting the right fight at the moment he's being clear and concise with his strikes he'll land the shots with good accuracy and move out he's conserving his energy he's been really economical thus far in this fight Heinzel's really struggling to kind of land anything decisive he needs to put punches in bunches and use combinations with his kicks and his, his hands well we're coming to the end of the opening round and for us it's a big round for the Polish fighter Eric Vilecki So, Dean, when you look at that round over the full duration, you mentioned that Heinzel took the center ring, but I feel that despite that, Vilecki took the sting out of it. Vilecki just implemented the, the footwork there was the difference. Heinzel was kind of waiting for his opportunity, and Vilecki simply took it. If you look at the replay here, changes his levels, uses the overhand right there to land straight onto the chin. There's the teep catch. Beautiful right hand straight down the pipe, follows up with the second one. Now, you mentioned the dangers of that teep for Heinzel. He's got he's to throw that sharply and smartly, hasn't he? He's got to really fire out, use his hip to drive it through like a missile, bring it back, and then put some punches on the end of it. So round two, and we have Vilecki from Poland taking round one. He was simply busier. It's as simple as that, really, isn't it, Dean? Yeah, he landed more strikes. He's very technical in his approach, and he's controlling this cage. I mean, you can see Heinz again sent a cage. Vilecki's using his footwork, using his nice high guard and his punches to land and really just kind of rack the points up here. Now, having said that, a bit more intent about Heisel here. He's already thrown two right hands coming forward, and there was one thing to control center of the cage, but I think Heinzel's corners had a, a word with him, and he's starting to work as well now. He's got to be more active here. Put combinations together nice. He's chasing now. Now he's going for the takedown. Heinzel now switching the levels and switched instantly by Vilecki. That was beautiful. He's got to fight for the underhook. He's going to try and pummel his arms on the inside of Heinzel's arms. Yes, and Vilecki doing, as you said, a, a good job there, sprawling and, and the underhooks there because. For me, it makes sense for Vilecki, as the first round went, to keep this upright. I'm still thinking right, though. He's going to change levels and, and, and force Vilecki to think upstairs and downstairs, and that will disrupt the rhythm in his striking. That said, Vilecki again, sharp kick to the lead leg, then brings it up to the head. I like the variety of the young Polish fighter's work. And we've seen here, Heinzel, we mentioned tactically it was the right thing to do to try and force the takedown. Can you see him trying to do this again here in the second round? He wasn't successful, but do you think he needs to try again? Yeah, he needs to set the takedown up with the shots. Though. He's got upstairs with some decisive punches, change level, and look for the takedown there. Yeah, Heinzel chasing his man, but Vilecki's happy on the back foot. This is the thing about him as well. He's a good counter striker, he's a good counter mover, and he comes forward, and it's the pace he decides. He leads you away, 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 then comes in quickly. 
Yeah, he's leading him away from the cage. He doesn't want his back up against the cage, but Heinz needs to force forward. He needs to cut him off with that right hook. If you notice that Vilecki has some excellent footwork, he uses lateral movement to turn out of danger. Heinz needs to cut him off with those hooks, drive him back to the cage, use the cage for the takedown. Yes, very good upright fighter, Vilecki from Poland. And Heinz, I felt, did the right thing, looking to test him down. Said, this is the great thing about MMA. There's so many ranges and, and levels you can fight at. Heinz now needs to see what Vilecki's got on the ground, but. He had a good sprawl defense, didn't he? Yeah, they tied up there for a brief while, but again, Vilecki in the break is, did a great job of using the hooks to distract Heinzel from his takedown. And now we're seeing Vilecki very heavy with his head. Now again, Heinzel went for the strike, but for the takedown, he didn't. there was no level change, was there? He yeah, just drove it. He wanted to use that cage and get the clinch. But now look, he's, he's attacking the legs, but you can see Vilecki using the underhooks to pull Heinzel back up. So, although Heinzel didn't go for the level change, he wanted that tie-up to get to the cage to then start slowly working, rather than the explosive, say, single or double leg takedown. Yeah, we can attribute that to kind of the con conserving the energy here in the tournament. A double leg shot needs to be set up with the hands, especially in May, um, but it takes a lot out of you to change your level of fire with explosive power. So, Dean, interesting second round. Heinzel tried to change tactics twice. I don't think he was successful. I, I think tactically, Vilecki is having this fight at his range on his terms. Yeah, you could argue that Vilecki is more technically advanced in, in, in the areas of MMA than Heinzel. He's just getting, he's getting there quicker, Malcolm, and it just seems to me that Heinzel has not got out of like the first round jitters and started to implement his own game plan, what he's good at, his, his natural attributes and his skills. He just really needs to go for broke here in this third round. Well, you did mention that the second time with energy conversa um, conversation, he, he, he did get his man to the fence. Then he started to work for the single leg, but Vilecki made him work the whole time and he was unsuccessful once more. Yeah, he died for the unhooks and then made him work, turn him on the cage, use the head pressure to force Heinzel to work and expend more energy. So third and final round of this junior featherweight bout. We have Eric Vilecki from Poland on our unofficial scorecards, possibly taking those opening two rounds. Franz Heisel from Austria, as you said in the third, your terms exactly needs to go for broke, Dean. That's true. I mean, but look at Vilecki as well. From the commentary position, it's difficult to score, and you never know what the judges see. They could have different backgrounds, different ways they see the fight. So Vilecki equally has to keep the punches coming. He's got to keep the pressure on, but look at Heinzel forcing forward with that. The punches there, that was beautiful stuff. And for the first time, Vilecki has to tie up, and he, and he looks to take his man to the cage wire. This is what you were asking of Heinzel, wasn't it? This is what you said he exactly had to do. Yeah, he had to put the pressure on, but I mean, credit to Vilecki, because closing the distance and using the underhooks to dictate the pressure in this position, using the cage to his advantage. And the longer they're in this position, as I said, the judges, as you rightly said, might see things totally differently from us. But if they're not, again, this is good tactically for his own safety again for Vilecki as well. If you're two rounds to the good with a tournament situation and progressing, conserving energy, saving himself from damage as well. Hansel now working center cage. Yes, he's come out with more intent here in the third franchise. Is it enough? Oh, and then we talk about the takedowns. It's actually the double leg from Vilecki. And timing so essential. For the first time, it's on his terms that Vilecki goes for the takedown. And in contrast, is successful. He's trying to solidify this fight here. That takedown will give him a huge advantage on the scorecards. But credit to Heinzel gets back to his feet. Could potentially threaten the guillotine here, but uses it to get the underhook. Going to try and turn Vilecki around on the cage, but Vilecki very heavy with that shoulder. And again, as you said, although Heinzel did a great job of getting back to his feet, it was still a takedown. It was a big score from Vilecki. And me, the difference between the two men across these three rounds is their use of tactics, their tactical awareness. And for me, it's been in favor of the Polish fighter. Yeah, and you can see Vilecki there using the knees to the legs and returned by Heinzel. And they're trying to kind of bruise the legs up. They take the spring up the step of the legs of their opponent. No needs to the head under these amateur rules. Um, so they were going to work the body and the legs here. And Vilecki stand heavy, doing exactly what he should be doing, using his head. See the way he's dipped his head underneath the chin of Heinzel. It serves to control your opponent up against the cage. 
and control the vital ingredient in this bout for me and I, I feel as the clock starts to tick on this third and final round we've seen more from Franz Heinzel in this third than we have the previous two rounds but I wonder whether it's enough Dean there's some desperation here from Heinzel he's grabbing the fence he's, he's even grabbing the rash guard of Vilecki he really wants to try and drag him to the ground well we're inside the last 10 seconds now and I've got a feeling if it stays like this Vilecki, the young Polish fighter, will go through to the next round and, and pretty fresh as well, despite going the full three rounds, pretty fresh. Yeah, he stayed quite safe. You can see there from his face that he's got no, no blood, no, no noticeable damage on his face. He did a great job of utilising his skills here in the cage. So Dean, looking at the two men, and, and you look for body language at the end. Um, Vilecki, the Polish fighter, touched gloves with his coach, big smile on his face. I think they're quietly confident that this is going to go their way. And do you know what? I tend to agree with them wholeheartedly. Yeah, I think once the dust settles on this one, you could safely say that Vilecki did all he could. And with all of his skills in the upstairs realm, striking and the downstairs realm, on the ground to secure this win. So we're going to get the official announcement. RMC going to the cage for the official announcement right now. Well, ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of action, we're about to go to the judges' scorecards. All three judges scored about 30 27. In favor of your winner by unanimous decision. In the red corner, representing Poland, Herrick Valek. Key. Three rounds shut out there, Dean, and, and rightly so. All three judges unanimous, all three the same, 30-27, mirroring our scorecard, to be honest. Vilecki was on a ta tactical mission there, and he accomplished that mission perfectly. He just really controlled the, the centre of the cage with his footwork. You see, you saw Heinzel in the middle, but Vilecki was able to move around on the outside, land decisive shots, even implement the takedown and control him from the top. Yes, good win there. And he goes through, progresses in this junior featherweight division. And this is the control we were looking at. As you said, although Heinzel is in the centre, Vilecki from the outside constantly striking, Dean. Yeah, he always implements a counter and then footwork after. He's got a beautiful guard there. And there was a barrage of punches from Heinzel, but he kept the guard nice and high. And here's the double leg. Watch how he turns the corner, drives a shoulder in. Heinzel did a great job of retaining guard there, but ultimately Vilecki got the takedown and remained on top. And this was the thing. That's the key, remaining on top in every aspect of this bout, wasn't it? Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your first fighter into the cage. Representing Ireland, Jordan Bradshaw. So, making his way to the cage, Ireland's Jordan Bradshaw coming out very fast and keen. Dina, and obviously you have to weigh in, you have to wait. You want to get in there, you want to get your first back going. And, and for us, for those at home, you know, it, it's the UK contingent now with Jordan Bradshaw here in the cage. Looking calm and confident. And as always, nerves are a good thing. They're telling you, look, you've got to perform, you've got to switch on. You've got to think about these psychological cues to make you ready to perform at your best, physiologically. And as we saw from the first bout, it's so essential that, you know, even if you're going the distance, I felt that Eric Vilecki, who won that first bout, the energy convers um, the way he saved himself, he looked good, he's still fit, he's still fresh. That all plays a part, doesn't it? Yeah, you've got to really think tactfully here in the IMAF. You've got to get the win and, and obviously chase for the finish. Everyone wants the finish, but you've got to think ahead. 
you've got multiple fights here over this, this five day span and um, you've really got to conserve your energy, particularly with injuries. Injuries is the biggest thing. If you get an injury that changes your ability to win the fight, that's going to play a, a major part. And then, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome his opponent from right here in Romania, Petia Florin. So, as you heard, Ricky announced Petia Florin from the host nation from Romania here, making his way to the cage. And obviously, it's a completely different ball game when you're the host country and you're representing the home team. Like it or not, the pressure's on you. Yeah, let's face it, Florin hasn't had to travel. He hasn't been on, sat on a plane. He hasn't had all the nerves uh, of packing. Have I forgot my passport? I forgot my money. Are my coaches with me? Are my family with me? So he's in his hometown. So it could have a hometown advantage, and that is a real viable advantage psychologically. Yes, but here, Florin just getting his pack down before he goes into the cage here. And Dean, you were mentioning how important it is, how even the subtlest of injuries can change your whole concept, your whole outlook, even if you're the winner of the bout. Yeah, that's true. I mean, it, the, the other thing is, can you perform and can you mask it? They're the important parts. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a junior featherweight contest. Fought over three three-minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing Ireland, Jordan Bradshaw. <laughs> Heads in the red corner, representing Romania, Petia Florin. Your referee in charge of the action, Miko Altenen. So Jordan Bradshaw, Ireland in the blue corner, Patia Florin, Romania in the red, the host nation, and immediately goes for the single leg, big pick up and slam there, Dean. Bradshaw threatening the guillotine there, and he's using it to try and defend. Armbar from the bottom here, Malcolm. This looks very tight. He's hooked it underneath the arm. He's got the wrist trapped. He's just got hyper extend that arm now. Well, this would be a quick finish and a safe finish for Jordan Bradshaw if he gets this. I mean, he responded so calmly, and as you said, this look, it's tight. You're right. It's an immediate finish. He responded so well to the slam, and if you're going to go through to the next round, you take out the hometown fighter, you do it inside a round, you do it with a submission, you do it safely. He's hardly even broken sweat. Beautiful work from the bottom there from Bradshaw. He did a great job of just defending that takedown. He threatened with submissions, a new level of takedown defense, and ultimately secured in the armbar in that position, locked the arm underneath his armpit, crashed the wrist together there of Florin, hyperextended hips, and he stayed very tight with his limbs against Florin's arm so Florin can escape. Now, if you were Florin, you'd have felt you'd done everything right. Hometown man, you pick the man up, show your strength, beautiful body slam. You look to go into position, and it doesn't happen. Suddenly, you're tapped out. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, referee Miko Altenen calls us off the contest. At 27 seconds of round number one, for your winner by armbar, representing Ireland, Jordan Bradshaw. Dean, you couldn't get a better start or a better finish for the young Irishman, Jordan. And he really just put himself back in this competition with an advantage. He finished so quick. He was in there for a very limited amount of time. You can see here from the replay that Florin goes in for that big takedown. And he, he, he went to follow him there. But Bradshaw using the submissions as takedown defense. You can see there he sneaks the knee in underneath. He's got one, an, an, an orthodox position here, one knee across, one over the head. And he's just very tight on that limb. And there's no way out there for Florin. As you said, it was very tight indeed, very cool. But as you said, even during the course of the slam, he was completely in control. Yeah, Bradshaw on the bottom, very active with his hips and his arms. That was the key there. Florin was just, just behind the game with the takedown and following up with a dominant position. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your first fighter into the cage. Representing Austria, Alessandro Mukenroda. We continue here in the junior featherweight division. Alessandro Mukenroda from Austria will make his way to the cage. And we've already seen in this division two contrasting bouts that sum up 
the excitement of a tournament situation. We've had a three-round game of chess, and we've had under 30 seconds with a submission. It, it, it's wonderful, isn't it, Dean? It's, this is what makes MMA so exciting. You can finish in so many realms. The ref can stop it. You can get submission. You can get the KO. There's so many things. Even people have been stopped with leg kicks, Malcolm. There's, you never know what's going to happen in, in the MMA case. That's why it's such a difficult sport. I mean, you have, really do have to prepare in every area, you know, physically, psych psychologically, even down to flexibility. So these athletes are, are coming here to put it on the line for this, the crowd and those watching at home. And then you get the added dimension. It's not just about your bite. As, uh, bite. as we see here with the replay, Vilecki having to work really hard across three rounds for, for his win, and yet still staying safe. That mental concentration, that mental focus, and, and the, the switch down there, the tactical work. That's what I love about it. And yet the following by what could possibly be his opponent doesn't break sweat. Yeah, Vilecki very tactful there. You can see him walking away with a nod, very calm and confident. And then we see the handiwork of Bradshaw. Watch how he cinches the guillotine up here. Constantly threatens Florin. And there we see the armbar, hyperextension of the joint. You can see the legs are very tight from Bradshaw. That's what locked that submission up, locked the joint into that position and enabled the hyperextension. And this is the thing you mentioned, so many different ways to finish, so many variables. But the point is as well, what adds the extra spice, the extra dimension, it's the tournament situation. Now, the replays we saw, for various reasons, both these young men are unscathed as they went through, but they went through in such contrasting style. That's what I love about what we're watching today, what we're part of today here at the IMAFs, Dean. And as I say that, Alessandro Mukunroda, with his headphones on, Dean, staying calm, staying relaxed, composed, a very young man making his way to the cage here yeah i love the way that he's got the beads around his neck a lot of athletes will look to uh, some sort of religion or just some sort of cue to put them in that zone of optimal functioning so they can perform at their best yes and getting greased up finally just before he enters the cage and how aware dean will, will these young men be of the previous bouts will, will they go back in the change will, will they know that Vilecki's won, that Bradshaw's won by submission. Will all this be playing a part in the background? And this is the affordance of a tournament situation. You can always go back and look the tail of the tape on your, your opponent if they fought before, if it's out there. But when can you see it live in front of you in the same week? Yes, very good point there. And, and you know, it, and again, when we look at the, the levels, it's been a very good standard so far in our opening two bouts for various reasons. Yeah, I mean, everything's ticked the boxes so far. And, and don't forget, these are juniors. These are young kids. They're very young in their MMA career. And now, please welcome his opponents, representing Kazakhstan, Merbek Tulaganov. <coughs> so Merbek Tulaganov from Kazakhstan making his way to the cage here again in the junior featherweight division. And it's great looking at the body language of the fighters cage side right beside us. We've got an incredible position here in the commentary booth, so privileged to be here. And just looking at the way, as I said, the, his opponent comes out with the headphones on. You mentioned the beads. And yet, Mebek just comes out calmly, looks at his coach as if to say, yep, yeah, you know, and Kazakhstan, great grappling and wrestling background, haven't they? Yeah, I mean, Sologanov has, has been here before, many grappling competitions to his name. Uh, it's an extensive wrestling record as well as a jiu-jitsu game here. And like you say, he's so calm and collected there as he gets the last-minute preparations from our team here, the cut team. And, you, and it's so interesting to try and read what's going around in his head by his facial expressions. He looks very calm and collected. And of course, when the cage door shuts, everybody changes to a different type of animal. So it's exciting to see how they're going to evolve when that cage door shuts and they have to perform. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a junior featherweight contest for the free three minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing Austria, Alessandro Mukanruda. <laughs> and his opponent, fine of the red corner, representing Kazakhstan, Mirbek Tulaganov. Over to our referee.
Alexandro Mukenroda, Austria in the blue corner. Mebek Jolinegelf in the red corner. This, the junior featherweight. It's the last of our opening junior featherweight bouts, and I've been very impressed with the standard and the level so far, Dean. Very high level stuff, and we're seeing that here from Merbeck using oh, beautiful knee to the body, use the hooks there to gain the control of the head and fire that knee into the midsection of Mukunroda. Yes, walking him down. Mukunroda light on his toes, the taller of the two men at the weight. And that's the other thing I've seen here in our opening three bouts is the weight distribution amongst our athletes is in, it's very different as well. Mukunroda using the fakes and the feigns to land that jab. He's got to be careful about standing in front of Merbeck. Oh, rights and lefts from Tuleganov, though. Heavy hands coming forward. Nice movement, though, from Mukunroda. Merbeck now looking for a way, and he's going to establish that jab to find his range. You can see there, he's using that movement to cut off Mukunroda. Yes. Tuleganov looks for the punches again, then looks to, to take his man down, but good d defense here from Mukunroda. And while they're, they're against the cage fence here, something worth noting here, Dean, our junior division is under 21, so you've got 18, 19, 20-year-olds, so you've actually got some men coming down from what would have been the senior divisions to fight in the junior division because they're still of the right age, which shows the, the quality. When we've talked about the quality level, that could be it, the fact that it's under 21, these juniors. And the dedication. If you think back to what you were doing at that age, I mean, most people would be going out drinking and socialising, enjoying their life. These guys are putting the work in, in the gym to come and perform for you tonight. Well, Mukan Roda, you look at his right eye, Dean, it's slightly puffy underneath, and Tuleganov is landing again as he threw that left hook, so he's obviously landing and making a mark there. And we mentioned again, having to go forward in a tournament position. And whether he goes through or not, Mukan Roda has had to eat those knees. He's got the little mouse under the right eye, and Tuleganov looks very strong to me. Merbeck putting the pressure on, going to the body and the head. Did a great job of securing that takedown. And now he's going to use the cage to his advantage here. He's going to try and stack Mukan Roda up and land those ground and pound straight through the guard. Good work defensively. Again, he has to eat that left hand of Tuleganov and Mukan Roda's eye, as we said already, puffy. And when you look at a tournament situation, if he is the man that goes through, he'll be the first so far to take damage. If he is, because in this last 10 seconds, for me, it's been a quite dominant round for Mirbek Tuleganov. Merbeck very active here, and he was trying to pass at the end of that round. He's still trying to advance his position, even at the end of the round when he's on top. So, Dean, if we looked at the body language of the two men going back to their corners, Mukan Roda looked like he'd been through a round. He'd been under pressure, and rightly so, because Tuleganov looks very strong to me. Heavy-handed, hence the damage to the eye. But then the takedown as well. He looks well-rounded, he looks grounded, and very strong at the weight. You see here from the replay, Merbeck using the hooks, a close range, put fires the knee beautifully straight down the middle, and here's the takedown. Watch him pull the hips away from the cage, accepts the guard there, but uses the cage to his advantage to land the ground and pound from that position. So for Mukunrod, it's been a very tough opening round because he's got a dangerous opponent upright, and then that same opponent who's dangerous upright initiates the takedown. Yeah, now Mukunroda has got to find an answer for these takedowns and those strikes close range. He's got to use the sprawl and brawl tactics, keep the arms nice and high, counter and move. So round two of potential three, we've got Merbeck to Leganov on our unofficial scorecard taking that first round. Alessandro Mukunroda from Austria needs to get back into this, got slight damage to the right eye, the taller of the two men, but again, it's following a similar pattern, the, f the second to the first, with Tuleganov looking to walk his man down, get inside and, and throw the hooks. Burbeck now using some fakes to land that left hook that closes him the distance, and now he's working in this position for the takedown. He's using the knees there to open up the underhooks. He's going to funnel his arms in. Mukunroda did a great job of staying busy close range. And you could argue Mukunroda's breathing quite heavily here. 
Yes, I, I felt that at the end of the first as well, Dean. He did throw a nice little right to the body on the inside when Merbeck cho changed the gap. But again, huge slam, and you heard the cry there. The air leaving the body of Mukenroda. Heavy, heavy slam, Dean. And this is what we spoke about early on from Merbeck, his grappling ability. He took that aerial and came down with force. Now he's going to work the guillotine up against the cage here. We could see a tap, Malcolm. It was close. You could see Mukunroda's hand come out there, Dean. And now this will be more secure, I feel. No. Did he get it, Dean? Has he got it? Has he tapped? He has. He oh, has. I'm I would so say sure. from the gasp of Mukunroda there that he tapped. And we didn't really have the angle to see the tap, but, I mean, that was really tight. And you notice Merbeck, he used the cage for the guillotine, but it didn't quite, he didn't quite get it. So he thought about technically advancing, pulled guard for more leverage so he could pull the arm round like a clock, use the legs to extend out. In this junior featherweight division, that's a very strong young man. As I said, we've seen that was our third bout, and we've seen three totally different bouts, which has been wonderful, and three totally different styles of finish. But for me, this young man, Tulegonov, looks strong at all ranges, Dean. Yeah, he's, he's going to be one to watch in this tournament for sure in the junior division. Very strong, and his grappling ability has taken him um, so far in MMA, and we just saw another example of that right here in front of us. But his striking set it up as well. Very good striker. Did damage to um, Mukunroda's face earlier with the strike, so he had him worried about the upright battle. So then while Mukunroda was worried about what was going on upright, he then slipped down below. So I think... Um, we're just waiting for, obviously, Alessandro Mukunroda to get medical attention. He's fine. He's right here above our commentary position. But because of the tap out from the guillotine, the medic's just making sure that he's safe. He is, but it's great there. Obviously, fighter safety, our paramount concern here at the IMFs. And he's shaking his head. That's more the warrior spirit of, I'm out of this tournament. Nothing to do with the fact that he's getting medical attention. It's the fact that I've just lost in a tournament I fully hope to win. Yeah, and to quote, it's not over until it's over. He's going to come back, he's going to compete again, he's going to look to come back in the IMF and secure the gold again, and, and that's, the, that's the kind of spirit of a fighter, to never give up, no matter how many times you get knocked down, you get back up. And a big smile now, Every, everybody's sporting their great finish, but it will be Mirbek to Leganov that goes through in emphatic fashion early in the second round. Ladies and gentlemen, referee calls to stop the contest at 1 minute and 16 seconds of round number 2. For your winner by guillotine choke, representing Kazakhstan, Medbak Tuliganov. at the replay here, the handiwork of Merbeck. And um, to, 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 to Mook and Roda, his credit, really, he did try and strike at that close range. And here was the damage done. You can see the wind on the face of Mook and Roda. That was a beautiful double leg. We heard the breath leave him. We actually heard it leave him there. And it was from there that he starts to set up everything else, isn't it? And there we go from the camera angle. There we can see the tap. They had their backs to us at the commentary position. But that was super tight. Merbeck elected to go to the ground and pull the full guard to get more leverage for the guillotine. And again, like we saw with Jordan Bradshaw, not a mark on him. So fresh, so strong. Those two, for me, pole position now when you look at what's gone on previously. Yeah, that's going to be an exciting fight to watch. And again, what I love, Dean, is the fact that we've got such different ranges, such different techniques, and I can't wait for more. Let's go ahead again for the next division. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your next fighter into the cage. Representing Germany, Edward Kexel. So, Dean, we move up to the junior lightweight division, and Edward Kexel from Germany coming into the cage. And yesterday, we were with the German team, very nice team of people there, and they were very, very excited to be here, just as a, a full team. That's what the IMAS means to, to these people. And that's the martial arts spirit as well. You can be a warrior in the cage, you can be a, a dangerous animal to tussle with, but outside, you're a humble human, you help people, you're very uh, approachable. Um, you know, this is, this is what the IMF consolidates, all, all the warrior and the martial arts spirit into one and puts it into this, this tournament and, and the competition of um, being a winner and, and obtaining that gold. And we had fun with the German team on, on the way here. 
and uh, we mentioned another little tournament and they looked up and go oh are, are you in the world cup as well which uh, it just shows they've got a sense of humor as well and please welcome his opponent representing italy matteo busico <laughs> So Matteo Busico from Italy, his opponent here in the junior lightweight division. And again, Dean, with the tournament situation, we've seen already across the opening three bouts this morning, such variety. It's been great to watch. We've had a three-round decision. We've had two submissions, but one so quickly in the bout, and the other one set up by strikes and a huge slam. I mean, so early in the contest, and we've had so much already, so many great talking points. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is MMA, and for those of you who are, are tuning in and watching MMA for the first time, this, this only gets better and better as the, the competition goes on. People get more hungry and hungrier, and they don't think about the kind of the, the tournament fashion. They want to go for the win and get that goal, so it gets more and more exciting as every fight progresses. And this one will be Germany versus Italy here in the junior lightweight division. checks for Busico and as we said Dean it, it, it's an incredible format because they'll be they'll be sharing changes not necessarily with their opponent but um, it's it's a great venue here and everybody's close and tight and they'll know what's going on as well and so Busico is in the cage ladies and gentlemen this is a junior lightweight contest Four over three, three minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing Germany, Edward Kexel. <laughs> and his opponent fights out the red corner, representing Italy, Matteo Bussico. <laughs> Your referee in charge of the action, Axel Vincemanate. Dean Kexel had to be pushed back almost by the referee. He was so keen to get across to the centre ring to meet Busico in the centre there. And we were talking to the German team and they said it's a mixture of new fighters and experience. Their team coming very excited. 50% new, 50% experienced. And Kexel, very good start there. Yeah, Kexel is a specimen. He's touted to be one of the junior lightweights coming out there of Germany. And you can see why. He closed the distance, implemented that real powerful takedown. And now he's trying to shut the hips off here. He's got to be careful about staying out of submissions. Busico is a great guard off his back. He likes to use the triangle in that position. Well, he set that up, Kexel, with a very strong straight right to the midsection to set up the takedown. And as, as you said, highly regarded with the German team who have this mixture of youth and experience. And it's a good position early in the back. As we said again, when you're thinking tactically about where do I go from here, safety and yet getting the job done. Kexel now staying very heavy with his hips. You notice he'll follow the hips of Busico. He doesn't want Busico to get an angle that enables the submissions and sweeps and escape from this play, uh, position that he's in now. And keeping Busico interested as well with that left hand of his that he works consistently to the left body and, well, the left hand to the right hand side of the body and head of Matteo Busico. Busico now frantically looking to get out of this position. He's going to post on the arm here. What he needs to do is put his hips back to the cage, post one arm on the ground, come up to his feet and stand up. Yes, working hard. Kexel here with those short chopping punches and looking to posture up now, Dean. Foot on the hip here from Busico. That will give him the space to try and move his hips away. But Kexel did a great job of sucking the hips back toward him. He wants to stay close in this grappling realm. He needs to think about passing the guard here in this position. The guard's open now, and the legs of Busico are open, so Kexel could pass the half or even full mount here. At the moment, though, he, he seems to be content to, to work methodically and slowly because he, he's got the takedown, he's got the score. We mentioned the tournament situation, that there's energy saving going on here, I feel, as well as scoring the points and, and being in dominant position. 
kicks he'll set very heavy from the top. He's forcing Busico to work on the bottom. You notice the more active of the two with regards to trying to move out of this position is Busico. But Kexel is following the hips, firing the body shots, firing in the head shots when need be, and staying safe out of submissions. Yes, it's a good tactic across this opening round from the moment he got the takedown, which was early. He, he set out his store very early, Kexel, and what he's done as well is slowly but surely moved Busico to his own corner, so he, um, Kexel will have his own corner talking to him here as he sees out this opening round. Time! Now you can see as they disengage, Dean, that he'd, Kexel had actually moved Busico right to his corner so he can get his own corner talking to him. How important is that, that you've got your corner there, you've got him right in front of you? Yeah, that's an old school tactic made famous more you know, from in the UFC from Matt Hughes. He'd pick his opponents up, drive them straight across the cage and dump them to the ground. But it's important because you can hear the advances from your coach's perspective. It's a different perspective when you're in the fight, you're having to move, you're having to stay active and stay out of submissions. Um, and they can see it from the outside, so they can see kind of advances and affordances that you could take that perhaps you can't sense or you can't see at that point in time. So that's a very smart tactic on Kexel's part. Well, you mentioned smart tactics. Once he got the takedown, he didn't do what we consider a great deal in terms of looking for submissions, but he knew what he was doing. He kept that body weight on him. He kept the small punches reining in. And as you said, the important thing was he kept making Busico work from his back. Just picking up the ice in the red corner that spilt onto the canvas. And we'll be ready for round two. See there, from the camera angle, there's a little bit of blood there on Bustico's head. It could have opened up from those body and head shots from Kexel. Let's see if that'll play a part here. Round two of this junior lightweight contest, Edward Kexel, Germany, Matteo Busico, Italy. And it's fair to say we had Kexel dominant control of that opening round and a nice left-right combination upstairs. He went straight to ground last time, but the man can box. And there's a spinning back fist return. Kexel tried it, Busico returned that, and Kexel used that advantage to get this fight back to the ground where he is at the strongest. Yes, he's got side control at the moment, but as you said, he slipped sweetly under the spinning back fist from Busico and is now there as you said in control once more and looking at it from the alternative perspective Busico must be frustrated what's he got to do Dean? Well, at the moment he's threatening submissions perhaps an inverted triangle maybe even the Darce if he can work that but he's got to get to his feet he's got to find the kind of little nuance to escape that position and get out he's got to be careful of the north-south choke here and it looks quite tight as you said that Dean it's good movement here from Kexel and this is worrying times for Busico Kexel's got to be careful here to not to turn this into a spine lock. He's working the, the kind of inverted guillotine position here, but he's getting a warning. You can't put pressure on the spine. Good call there, Dean, and the referee letting him know there. But it shows again that Kexel at the moment seems to be just that one move ahead of his opponent each and every time. That's his ability to stay on top and stay dominant whilst keeping busy. It's the wrestling and grappling pedigree behind Kexel that's enabling him to stay on top here. Yes, and it's been good control from Kexel. Um, Busico being forced to work. I mean, but to be fair to Busico, he's been looking for the submissions when he gets the opportunity from his back. Has to eat a big right hand there. And that was a vicious right hand that he had to eat. We've already seen the slight damage to his face. And this is when we mentioned the, the every aspect of the tournament situation. Kexel is really putting him through the grinder at the moment. And it looks like he's going for that choke again, Dean. He's trying to set the the north-south choke and threatening the guillotine too, but he's staying nice and heavy. He's going to try and block the arm off here, and that will expose the other arm of Busico. Busico turning his hips down, he's got to be careful about getting his back taken, again working for the inverted triangle. And and there he there goes. we go. Yes, he could have given up his back here, Dean, well spotted, and it's been a tough, tough time, and he realises this, Busico, but it's been a tough time for him these opening two rounds. Kexel immediately looking for mount, but Busico very quick with his hips, locks up the half guard a much better position than have somebody in the full mounted position you can see there Kexel trying to skip his right leg over 
the left leg of Busico to obtain the full mount. The problem for Busico is he's working well defensively, but everything he's doing is in defensive mode when it comes to the judges and point scoring. Busico now using the arms to post out to create distance between him and his adversary as the round comes close to an end and Kexu again with dominant pressure from the top and working the punches to keep busy to prevent Time. the stand -up. Those right hands have been heavy across this round. So Dean were two rounds down and Matteo Busico got up very slowly and walked very slowly back to his corner. That shows the pressure that Edward Kexel has put on him across these opening two rounds. Yeah, that's a real labor, having a, a dominant, stronger, a bigger grappler on top of you, and forcing you to work off the bottom. He can't really uh, obtain his hips up into an aerial point of view. We see from the replay here, the spinning back fist that was the end for Busico because Kexel implemented the distance change and the takedown. Now he finds himself on top, and there's the big There's punches. that right hand, oh yes. And Dean, it's been two very good controlling um, rounds for, for Kexel. And you mentioned the fact that how alert he was. He slipped under and he used actual um, Busico's own movement against him for that takedown, didn't he? Yeah, that, that's kind of the, the Jedi spirit of gra in the grappling world. If you grapple that long, you've got kind of a, a, an internal feel of where your opponent's uh, perhaps going to be or where he wants to go and you, and you head him off before he gets there. So here we go, round three of this junior lightweight contest between Eduard Kexel from Germany and Matteo Busico from Italy. And we have got Kexel in control of those opening two rounds. Now maybe if Busico can keep it upright for a bit longer because when he's been taken down, even though he's been good defensively, he's been forced to defend and that's the point. Oh, it's a big right hand there. We got a beautiful from Kexel. Oh, the uppercut and the right hand forging forward with the punches now here in the third, and it shows. And then the slam. It's a nightmare for your opponent when you're good upright and then you're good on the ground as well. And that's what Kexel seems to be, Dean. Busico seems to have been shying away from the stand-up battle there. He's got some excellent kickboxing skills, a nice rear kick, but Kexel did a great job of shutting him down on the feet and on the ground. You can see him on the top now, the open guard. And Busico really needs to work to his feet. He wants to stuff the head, get one arm posted on the mat, move the hips up to the cage and use it to cage walk up to his feet. Now for Busico, it's been a hard, hard opening two rounds. Now, Kexel, he's been, he's been working hard, but within his comfort zone, Dean, do you still think, I mean, he seems unscathed in the corner. The corner had the ice on his chest. They were talking calmly to him. A nice three rounds, do you think, so far? Yeah, I mean, he's, he's, he's ticking all the boxes with regards to MMA, and obviously he's gone away and worked on his strength and conditioning with regards to power, and he's proficient in the, dr the grappling and striking realm. And the thing in the middle is he knows how to merge them together, to how to get the fight to the ground if he wants, or indeed keep it standing. That's the key in MMA. Can you merge the boxing with the wrestling? Can you merge the jiu-jitsu with the Muay Thai? It's beautiful to watch, and Kexel is really doing a great job of that. And yes, and, and so if we look for positives from Matteo Musico, very good defensively, minimizes um, the amount of damage he's taking, but the, the negative for him is it's always been in defensive mode. Busico struggling to get out of that mode as you alluded to, and it's really just Kexel being very dominant and busy, and you can see here from the guard, and it's a defensive position for Busico, and he's just not really offering any threat, and that's because Kexel's using the cage to pin him up, to limit the hip movements. Busico needs to pull those hips up towards the head for triangles and arm bars. He, he simply can't do that whilst he's stuck under Kexel. And again, Kexel, he just explodes with those short punches. I said, singularly, they're probably not damaging. But this, the regularity throws them as well. Body head, body head right, body head, body head left. And keeps Busico guessing, doesn't he? Or, or, and not being able to be in a position where he's thinking about his own submission defense attempts. Kexel now staying busy here. And the referee did urge him on to, to stay busy. This is why he's rising up now and smashing these punches down here. But Busico did a good job of controlling the head of Kexel to limit the power. And he's doing a great job of kind of funneling his arms on the inside of these punches Time. to limit the power. Dean, it was three hard rounds, but for very different reasons for both fighters. Three hard rounds because of the intensity of the work from Kexel three hard rounds for Busico because he had to defend, defend, defend. 
and he's getting the, the medics looking at him here because the ground and pound of Kexel was consistent. Yeah, he wants to stand up here, and, and this is what I love about the IMF. They bring in the best from all angles. They want to check the fighter's okay. You know, is his vision okay? Has he got his equilibrium before we let him stand up and walk out of the cage? Um, they really are making sure that these athletes are looked after with regards to the health, the hydration, everything. And this is the professionalism of the IMF. The other thing to be said about this, Pat, because we know that um, Busico, that that's just to check, as you said, for his safety, is that we've got a very, very strong young man from Germany here in Kexel. You alluded to that when he was coming in, saying that, th that they rate him there in Germany. And we really saw why here today, didn't we? Yeah, his, his awesome power is such a, a specimen of a man, coupled with the, the technical MMA skills and the ability to consolidate those skills and use them to his advantage. And yes, as you can see here, Matteo Busico talking to the medic, saying that he's okay. And he, he's just um, frustrated more than anything. We saw this before as well. While they're talking to the medics, they're more just disappointed about losing in, in such an illustrious tournament. It's not about, am I damaged? It's that I'm out of this tournament. Yeah, I mean, uh, there's a lot on the line, a lot of sacrifices, diet, you know, you, you, you sacrifice your personal life, relationships, um, you know, even, even education. Some people drop out of university to try and um, achieve their dream in the MMA. And, and this is a huge, the biggest platform to catapult yourself in the MMA world. Now, let's say one thing. We're saying that, but we haven't had the official announcement yet. But the body language from both fighters, Busico just looking at his coach, his arms out and then sighing. I don't think... Either of them are in any doubt about which way this is going. I mean, Ricky's got to make it official now. Ladies and gentlemen, at the three rounds of action, we've had to go to the judges' scorecards. The judges scored about 30 27, 30 26, and 30 25. All three in favor of your winner by unanimous decision. In the blue corner, representing Germany, Edward Kexel. Yes, one to watch, Edward Kexel, and that wasn't just a dominant. Two of the referees saw it very. Two of the judges saw it. Sorry, saw it very dominant indeed, Dean. Yeah, that that scoring was apt. I mean, Kexel did a great job of controlling in all areas and really came up on top and, and stole away those points from Busica. Yeah, Busica, his face said it all, and it just shows how important this tournament is to these young athletes. And as we said, the, the junior division is actually under 21, and this is what he had to take. So good on the ground, and yet when he exploded upright, Kexel was strong there as well. It was every angle he had covered, didn't he? And Kexel knows when to come in. You can see from there, from the, he takes a little bit of the spin and back fist, but it doesn't phase him. He's on the game of advancing. He looks to take the, the fight to the ground. That was a huge right hand there. That was the right hand that did the damage to the eye that they were looking at. And his accurate... Uh, this man is going to be a beast at this weight and this level. When you look at the, the ability across all ranges, that, that, that is tight punches. They're short, chopping hard punches. Beautiful work here from Edgar Kexel, a specimen from Germany and one to watch in this tournament. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your first fighter into the cage, representing the Kingdom of Bahrain, Nayev Fikhey. We move up to the junior welterweight division, Nayev Fikhey, Bahrain, making his way to the blue corner. And Dean, as, as we mentioned, with, with the, the ruling system here, the juniors under 21. So this is why we've seen such skill. We, we've had, you know, technically guys that could fight in the seniors dropping into the juniors here to compete. So we, and it's been reflected, I think, in the level of quality we've seen this morning. Really impressed with the, kind of the skill level of these athletes at such a young age. And it just, it makes you more kind of thankful that the organization IMF is, IMF is around because it gives them to kind of, the opportunity to nurture and, and catapult and, and use this to um, pull their skills forward and get cage time to be more kind of confident in these positions and fighting. 
And please welcome his opponent, a representing Italy, Leonardo Oliver. So Bahrain versus Italy as Leonardo Oliver makes his way to the cage and no nonsense there. And it's great, Dean, even watching the way they come from the changing rooms to the cage, whether they march out, whether they roll out with the headphones on. Um, Oliver strode out straight to cage side as if to say, come on, get me greased up, let's get me in there. Vicky now with a bit of urgency in the cage, pacing back and forward, waiting for... Leonardo to make his way and get this underway and looking at the two athletes here I'd, I'd hazard a guess to say that Leonardo is the taller of the two I was thinking the same Dean is it's that body weight distribution we talked about again because Vicke looks stockier and shorter and possibly more muscular at the weight whereas you've got the lean and taller Oliver which we've noticed in previous bouts the, the weight distribution is fascinating when it comes to how the bout might pan out Ladies and gentlemen, this is a junior welterweight contest for over three three-minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing Bahrain, Nayev Vichay. And his opponent finds at the red corner, representing Italy, Leonardo Oliver. Your referee in charge of the action, Mr. Reben Seber. Round one, junior welterweight division. Naef, Fike, Bahrain in the blue. Leonardo, Oliver, Italy in the red. And as you said, Dean, he is the tall of the two men. Can he make the range pay? Fike has some good Muay Thai techniques. He'll often parry out the kicks and respond straight away with punches. And he's got to kind of gauge the distance here. And Leonardo using that range to force him back against the cage here. Yes, as you said, though, um, Nayef Fike happy to stay in the pocket with his opponent. He, he's staying within range, so as you said, when he parries, he can fire back if necessary. Just like that, with steps forward with the left and right combination. And that's what he's got to do against somebody with a reach advantage on him. He's got to make him miss, make Leonardo miss those punches, parry those punches away, use it to gain the distance, or indeed counter, and then move the head off that center line. Well, he went for the body lock when they got in close, but... Oliver was having none of that, and I, I think Leonardo wants to test his, his opponent at this range at the moment with those long limbs, as you said. And that right hand came through the channel, they both trade punches, but I think Leonardo Oliver got the better of those exchanges, Dean. Fike has got a chin, though. He ate those shots up like lunch, and he's coming forward still. And this is another key here. He can't get kind of too tentative and walk backwards and, and, and put his back against the cage. He needs to stay in this fight. Well, he pushed forward again, went for the for the body lock again, and this time it Silva went to um, Leonardo Oliver went to turn him, but didn't manage it. Leonardo looking for a hip toss there, nearly gave up his back. That's why he was forced to turn into Fike, and Fike now with a double underhooks, I believe. He's trying to funnel that left arm in. He's dropped down for the double leg. He's going to try and pull the hips away from the cage of Leonardo. He gets the takedown, and I think the timing was right because. Um, Leonardo looked dangerous upright at that range, looked, knew how to handle that reach advantage. So when that happens, change tactic, let's look at a different arena. Yeah, smart tactics by Fike, he tasted the power, yeah, even though he walked through it, he didn't want to let that build up in the head area, and then kind of messes his equilibrium up, so he's going to look to work on the ground here. Ground and pound, he's got to stay active in the body, but he's got to be careful about the legs here from Leonardo. Leonardo working for the triangle. Yes, and I was just about to say that, as we mentioned previously, um, Nayafika was turning Leonardo subtly towards his own corner, towards his own camp there, and moving him. But as you said, doing a good job defensively, Leonardo Oliver. Yeah, he's got that he's got a meat hook there. You can see the left arm around the right arm of Fike. That's to stop the punches, to limit the movement of the punches, and also to set up the triangle. See there, he puts the, the shin against it. He looked to fit that leg around the head and secure the triangle, but he's very aware of that. Postures up and uses strikes to keep him busy. 
a round of two halves there, Dean. For me, the first half, the control upright from Leonardo Oliver. Now, as you said, Fike took the punches well, but he was forced to take them. And then he changed tactics and changed the course of the round in the second half there. And this is what happens in MMA. You, 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 you can taste what your opponent's got and you can change the dish. And that's what we saw from Fike. He chose to put that fight on the ground, stayed on top, and used the ground and pound to rack up the points. Now, having said that, you, you had some pointers there. As we said, this is upright. He, he goes for the lock twice, and, and both times Oliver stops him. And there's the punches that, as you said, he eats them, but he, he takes, there's the right that he took particularly well. And then he changes tactics to this position. He consciously took that decision to take this fight to the ground after he ate that. But he didn't show that he was hurt, even if he was. He said, look, I've got a chin. I'm going to stand in front of you. And that makes Leonardo think this is going to stay in the striking realm, but all of a sudden, Fike chooses to take it to the ground. Round two of three in this junior welterweight bout. Nayef Fike, Fike Bahrain in the blue corner. Leonardo Oliver, Italy in the red. And we've got it around of two halves the opener. And immediately, Nayef looking to go where they went at the end of the opening round. He feels, I think, more confident and strong in that ground and pound position. Immediately initiated the clinch here. He's working to grab the legs. He's a bit high, he needs to get behind the knees here. And you see Leonardo funnel that arm in and push the head upwards for Fike. Excellent takedown defense. Leonardo now working the over under the 50 50 position, as sometimes it's called. Fike now working the legs with the punch. He's very active up against the cage, looking to. Get the damage up there, and now look, we a bit of a skip of the leg there, don't they? I was going to say, fake. Leonardo shot forward. across the cage there, didn't he? And then he suddenly stopped and said, oh, I'm, I'm just that bit too close. But they both set out their stall now, haven't they, here in the second round? As you mentioned, Naya Fike felt confident in that situation, taking to the ground. Leonardo wanted that right. Now, I think there's been a groin strike there, and, and Naya will be given time to recover. But it's a fascinating contest, this one, with the contrasting styles, isn't it? And here it is. Oh, <laughs> there's no doubt about that one, Dean. That was right through. But there again, what a strong young man. He only just barely acknowledged that that was a strike right to his groin. Okay, now using the time to cut and recover. And this will be a welcome break for both fighters here to regain the oxygen, de oxygen debt to suck up the air, to think about tactfully how they're going to advance for the rest of this round. And Leonardo, you feel, will want to keep this upright for a while, working behind that tip, the left, right, yes, long straight punches again, forcing Nayef back. Nayef looks to come forward again, but it's a, he's either going to be right in, Dean, or right out of range when, when Leonardo starts throwing those straight punches. Beautiful check left hook there from Leonardo. I like to see him work the uppercuts as Fike comes in. He tends to leave his arms out and put his chins ever so slightly down when he wades in with those hooks. Yes, there is a there is a head, head down and, and sort of like whirling motion to his punching compared to the straight work here of Leonardo Oliver. And that's what Nayef Fike has to work out here is when to come in, when to stay out because that's a dangerous striker in front of him. There, gets caught on the way in again. It's so difficult when you're the shorter man. To see Fike utilize some leg kicks on that lead leg. Leonardo's very heavy when he steps in with those punches. If Fike can use the head move, move the head off the center line and work the lead kick. The strange thing is, though, Dean, he's looking to stand and trade as, as if he fancies it. And it's not working for him. He's getting caught here. And, he, and as I said, he's a tough lad, you mentioned in the chin. But he's been forced to blink with the impact two or three times there, getting caught on the way in and then staying there like he does now. For me, with what we've seen his strengths are, it's a very dangerous game because Leonardo just moves out of range there. Now he looks for the takedown. Yeah, that was an explosive flying knee there to the midsection from Fike. Didn't land, but it allowed him to gain the distance to grapple with his opponent. Now he's on the top, but Leonardo very active off the ground, punching the head there of Fike. It was almost like Nayef had to take those shots to wake up, wasn't it? As he said, no, I don't want to be here. This is where I need to be. But we're right at the end of this second round again. And he's delicately poised this. Now, Dean, not so much a round of two halves this time. For me, Nayef 
seemed inexplicably to stand and trade for a long part of that round with Leonardo, even when he was on the receiving end. It suddenly took those last two or three shots for him to say, I don't need to be here. Yeah, I mean, there was control in the striking realm. And it's often hard to see. When someone gets taken down, it's right there in front of you. I took you down, you couldn't stop me. But what Leonardo did was utilize the footwork here and the punches, as you see, even if he's getting taken down, he's still throwing the punches to the head there. But what will the judges see? Will they see the movement of uh, Leonardo and his ability to land the strikes? Or will they see Fique's ability to take the fight to the ground as soon as he gets his hands on Leonardo? Yes, it's um, the first round we felt was very back and forward. Second round, as you rightly said, I think it's all about the judges' perspective of what they want to see when it comes to the point scoring. So third and final round coming up. Round three of this junior welterweight contest. Naya Fike Bahrain in the blue, Leonardo Oliver Italy in the red. And I just get the feeling Leonardo will want this upright for as long as possible. He walking his man down, throwing those simple, the bread and butter techniques straight left and right, but using that height and range advantage to keep it at distance. Right round kick from Leonardo. Fique's corner, calling for him to advance. They want him to go forward with the punches, land these punches, show Leonardo that, look, I've got power, I've got hands too, and force him to back up. Now, he, he threw that overhand, right? But it's easier said than done, because previously when he came in, he just had to eat the left hook as he had to again. And that's why he's gone for the takedown again, Dean. When he comes forward for the punching, he has to eat the hooks. Leonardo trying to stuff the head downward of Fique. Fique He's got to look to switch this up, perhaps even to a single leg. Maybe work the inside and outside trips and use some circular movement, but Leonardo, great takedown defense. Yes, and he's coming into his own at range here. You can see the looseness of his shoulders. He's, he's working his way into this upright boxing technique style and nice and light on his toes. And as I said, for Nayef, the problem is the corner telling him to do it. It's easier said than done closing that gap safely to get where you want to be. Okay, now taking a step back, he needs to be careful about stepping directly backwards. He needs to use lateral movement. So and he got clipped with the right hand again, Dean. This is the danger from now. For the first time, he's had to back off. We've mentioned what a solid chin he's got, but now he's being hit consistently. He's listening to his corner, but getting caught, trying to implement what they're asking him to do. And again, he's getting caught by the left. Um, Leonardo's just stepping back. He's loose. He's throwing the punches as... Nayef's coming in, and I think he's playing into his Italian opponent's hands at the moment. Okay, he needs to implement some head movement here to duck that head, to slip from side to side when he comes in. You can see, when he, as he advances forward, his head's on that centre line, so Leonardo can target that perfectly. Well, as you said, he's either got to, he's got to make that movement, either for a level change in the takedown or to roll and throw. It's one of the two. You roll and you throw if you're going to stand and engage with him, or you roll and then initiate that level change for the takedown because at the moment, as you rightly said, Dean, this is perfect. Look, look, he's finally having to back up now, and he's finally showing that he's feeling these punches because it's all at Leonardo's range. And it's only because he's such a tough young man, he's still in there. And he's eating these shots, but they do work their way up to a point where they mess with your equilibrium, your balance, your ability to fight. That's a nice body kick there, and it looked like Leonardo was hurt. This could be a real turnaround, Dean. You're right, he got caught there. He suddenly stopped in the midsection, and that was all that Nayef needed. What a turnaround. It was all in Leonardo's favour. Then you called it. The body kick came in, and suddenly Leonardo stepped and gave just the hint. Is it enough late in the bout? What a turnaround. Massive shift of inertia there. At the end from Fike, that body kick was beautiful. And he's got his hands up. He believes he's won this. And you can still, and there we go. Leonardo matches that. And as, there is his coach's smart play. Look, put your hands up, show the judges that you believe you won. Yes, tactical awareness from both teams. But that third round had absolutely everything, Dean. You had Nayef Fike dis deciding to stand and trade with Leonardo Oliver and being punished for most of the round with it. And then, in desperation, when the crowd, the Italian supporters here, are getting behind Leonardo, forging forward, suddenly, out of desperation, Nayef throws the body kick. It lands perfectly. And Leonardo suddenly goes, ouch. And then Nayef flies forward, takes him down. It'll be interesting to see how much of the round the judges attribute to both men's skills here. This is, on a, this is potentially on a knife edge.
What a fascinating bout from these two. Lovely contrasting styles to set up that three rounds. And we spoke about how Fike should have implemented the low leg kicks, but he impl implemented the kick to the body that actually changed it around and could have won in this fight. I mean, it's, it's very exciting to see what the judges have on their scorecards. I'm eager to see who's won this one. My gut feeling, if I come off the fence, is they're going to go with the Italian in the red corner, but that's just unofficial. We're waiting the decision here. IMF European Championships in Bucharest in Romania. Well, one of the reasons for this could be close, and they could be looking at the scorecards very closely, Dean, before we get the official announcement to make sure that it's the right one, because this is the longest we've had for a decision so far, and we have admitted with the clash of styles, it could be judging perspective at play here. Here comes Ricky finally to announce it. And I think there has been a little bit of debate on this one. Well, ladies and gentlemen, before I announce the official decision, let's hear for both fighters in what was an excellent contest. And after three rounds of action, we've had to go to the judges' scorecards. The judges scored about 30, 27, Fike. Yeah. 30, split. 27, Oliver. And 29, 28 in favor of your winner by split decision. In the red corner, representing Italy, Dean, Leonardo Oliver. Right. Wasn't that interesting? One judge gave all three rounds to Fike. The other judge gave all three rounds to Oliver. And I went with the third judge that gave it to Oliver by the closer margin. I'm glad I called it right, but it shows how delicately balanced that whole bout was. I mean, they always say, never leave it in the hands of the judges. And sometimes you can't help that. You've got to get after it and look for the finish. I mean, after you hit him with that body kit, he swarmed in. And you could see Leonardo cover up for a second. Look at the replay here. And the handiwork Leonardo, that beautiful straight punches down the pipe. And you can see him, Fike's punches did the takedowns here. And you see Leonardo very active whilst the takedown is being obtained. There's the overhand right. Let's see if we can see the body kick from the replay. Boy, that, boy, that wasn't it. There's Fike running forward. I think that was just after the body kick. Just after that body kick, Dean, yeah. the fight, yeah. 20 seconds earlier, this could have been a different bout, but that was, as he takes him to ground there, you hear the last 10 second clicker come in, and I think that's what did it for Leonardo, but what a great bout. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your first fighter into the cage. Representing the United Kingdom, Juan Crocker. So representing the UK here at Junior Welterweight, Ron Crocker. And we were talking to Nigel, the coach, beforehand and raised this young man quite highly, Dean. Yeah, he alluded to his ability to work his striking at distance and his ground game. So, I mean, you can see there from the cauliflower ear that he's also been work putting time in on the mat in the grappling realm. And we'll see that if he can deliver under the lights and in front of the crowd here at the IMF European Championships. Well... Chris Reese in his corner there, very, very good coach, and our own Nigel as well. So a good team there in the corner for Crocker. And again, tall at the weight. And please welcome his opponent, representing Romania, Marvin Belechu. So Marvin Belecio, Romania, the hometown fighter. And we mentioned before the pros and cons of being from the host nation, Dean. Yeah, he hasn't had to travel extensively far. No plane journeys, no packing, no passport problems. You know, he, he got to wake up in his own bed, presumably. And, and he's uh, looking quite calm and confident as he gets the Vaseline applied from the officials. The negative, though, Dean, is obviously, with any host nation, the weight of expectation. 
yeah, the pressure of a nation is on his shoulders. Um, and, and that's the key here with the psychological advances in sport. It's, it's, it's important to, to, to get there and to use them to your advantage and work out the psychological cues and the preparatory um, instances to make yourself perform at that high level. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a junior welterweight contest, fought over three three-minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing the United Kingdom, Ruan Crocker. And his opponent fight at the red corner, representing Romania, Marvin Belichu. Your referee in charge of the action, Mr. Mateus Khudjian. Junior welterweight division, Crocker United Kingdom, Belechu, the host nation, Romania. And it was instant from Crocker there, Dean. Shooting the double leg there, working the single, but great sprawl from Belechu. Belechu using the underhook now to turn to take the back. He's got to be careful about his leg, but still his right leg is in jeopardy now. But Crocker equally has to be careful about getting his back taken here. He's got to make sure he follows his right arm in so he's facing face to face with his adversary. It was an instant decision, wasn't it, from Crocker? No two ways about it. Straight in, straight for the legs. And as you said, Beliccio responded instantly. Beliccio now controlling the wrists. And the affordance of the gloves here, even though you're not allowed to hold the gloves, if you hold the wrist there on the forearm, the glove kind of gives you a bit of an anchor to control those arms a little bit better. Now you mentioned Crocker got himself out of a potentially difficult situation, almost gave up his back there from that takedown attempt. And we mentioned the psychology earlier. Does that have an effect on you when you go for something and suddenly you're thinking, this isn't where it was meant to be? Yeah, I mean, you can't let that voice in your head say, oh no, you can't take him down. You've got to keep going, set up the takedowns with strikes and, and keep fighting for what you're good at. I mean. You can see Crocker now on the top. He's trying to work out of this position, but I'd like to see him pass the guard. He needs to put some pressure on the legs. Now the legs are open. Use the ground and pound to pass into a more advantageous position. He closes it again, though, Belechio. So he's thinking from the base as well. He's not making it easy, but I don't think that um, Belechio would have been happy to be in this position either from when he had that one, uh, uh, as we saw, the opportunity to grab the back of Crocker. And now he's in defensive mode again. And we've seen the judges do score in this position, the attacking fighter. We've seen that right throughout these early encounters. Let you looking for the arm by. Look, I like to stand up there, but eats a few shots as he gets to his feet. Well, he had a hammer fist there from Crocker. And again, Crocker looks to me like he wants this on the ground, Dean. This is where he wants this to be. Yeah, he's staying close, he's weaving around the leg. He's looking for the trip here. He might look to turn around to his left side. Maybe even a body lock, hip to hip throw. Belechu that was looking for the hip toss there and he looks like he's oh he's kind of <laughs> he's in the, um, an omoplata position but he's got the wrong leg around the arm very precarious position here well it's been intriguing because in both takedowns neither has, has come to fruition properly have they it, it's like it, it's been quite messy nothing's really come cleanly as they wanted Here. We're seeing Crocker try and stay active on top, but Belichu's ability to control the limbs of Crocker is really Time. damage. Um, but he, he sits there with his guard open. I'm sure his corner have seen that. And they're going to look to ask him to advance to a better position when he's on top. For the first time today in what's been an intriguing series of contests, probably the most difficult opening round to score for the judges.
if you were sat there, Dean, how would you go? Because neither, neither of the takedowns were clean. Neither of the men really got what they wanted from either takedown, and they looked to, to better bad positions. If you were having to sit, what, what would your thinking be if you had a judge's hat on? Well, I mean, almost certainly Crocker's from the top, very dominant. He's landing the strikes there. He's, he stayed in this position. I mean, there wasn't really any decisive submission attempts um, from Belecu. I mean, he secured that on the platter position, but with the wrong leg that allowed Crocker to escape and stay on top. So I'd edge towards Crocker. So round two of this junior welterweight contest, Crocker in the blue corner, Belecu, the hometown fighter, in the red. Not much between them. Dean believing that possibly the striking of Crocker, and again, goes for that double leg once more. He set out his stall right from the opening seconds of this back, Dean. Belecu now looks like he's got both arms in here and the head, but Crocker senses that and pops it out. He could have finished the guillotine with one arm in, with two arms in, very difficult to get the submission from that position here. And Belecu, he's trying to control here, and it says to me that he wants to stand up, Malcolm. He's overhooking the arms there, limiting the punches, stagnating kind of the position here. He wants to get to his feet. He doesn't want to be on the bottom. That's smart play. He doesn't want to be underneath Crocker with such an excellent ground game. So that said, that's why, on the inverse, Crocker is so keen to get it to the ground, knowing that Belecu probably prefers it upright, trying to take his strengths away because it's been instant, hasn't it? Beginning of the first, beginning of the second, Crocker has wanted to be in this position. And he's long-limbed, ideal for the, the posturing up and ground and pound at this weight. Belecu's corner, calling out for the... Oh, beautiful scissor sweep. Nearly got it. I was just about to say, they're calling out for the, the triangle, um, but it looked like he's used that to set up the scissor sweep. He wants... Crocker to load the weight across the knee shield and then sweep to one side whilst blocking the arm. That was a good attempt, and he needs more of that. He needs to stay busy and threaten different submissions and different sweeps to obtain the top position or even get to his feet. That said, some very strong hammer fists from Crocker as he postured up there. You mentioned in the first round that if you're going to err on the side of one, it was the striking of Crocker, and he's doing a good job here again when he gets the opportunity in the second. Very heavy from the top, using the cage to his advantage. You notice the knee across the belly there, the right knee of Belecu. Oh, beautiful stuff. And that's what we were talking about, the right time to sweep. And now he finds himself on top with the ground and pound, Malcolm. Yes, and the crowd respond here, the Romanians here at cage side responding to their man. And it's the first time Crocker has been under pressure. Crocker with a very fancy inversion to attack the leg, and he's very aware of the positions and the submissions allowed and not allowed in this competition and he used it to sweep on top to a more dominant position that was an excellent turnaround because for a moment there he was in real trouble and it was it was slickly done by the uk fighter i've got to be honest let you now find himself having to tie up the arms of crocker to limit the strikes with the, he's got the overhook there He's using the cage, he might use the cage to try and set up an armbar on that side. And that's why Crocker will try and drag him away from the cage and pin his head up against it. Yes, good work from Crocker again, and it's a very close technical bout, this one. Possibly the closest, the most technical time. so far today, and there's time to end the second round. Dean, it's been very close in the sense that minor adjustments have caused the successes, and again, for the judges, they're looking at subtle things here to score. Immediately the, for the yeah. second round, straight into the takedown. The replay showing to the grappling pedigree of Crocker. And here he's very calm and collected here. And it's a technicality that you alluded to. He picks his shots, he keeps his posture up to stay away from the triangle. And he lands the hammer fist there. They're, they're getting through. Beautiful. Now, Belecu had his moment, and this is what impressed you. And this was his moment, wasn't it? He used the sweep there, the scissor sweep to land that ground and pound. I mean, and that was an impressive sweep, and he's got to imp implement that from his back. He's got to stay very active, perhaps stay away from tying up too much, only when he needs to limit damage, open up, use the knee shield, the scissor sweeps, and really kind of work that position, land on top. So we're in the third round of this junior welterweight contest, third and final round, Crocker from the UK in the blue. 
Belichu, the Romanian host in the red, and immediately Crocker once again. We knew this was going to happen. We knew this is where he wanted to be. And Belichu there had a great sprawl, but he made a mistake in grabbing round the, the midsection with both arms of his adversary. He needs to dig in for the underhooks while sprawling heavy on the head with his hips. And that allowed Crocker to drive back to the cage and obtain the takedown. And for Crocker, he's right there in front of Chris and Nigel to give him that and there's advice. The sweep again. But again, that turn again, as you mentioned, the sweep from Marvin. But he gives up exactly the same position here with Crocker inverting on the bottom. And last time he used his, the X guard, he'd, he'd try and funnel his legs around the left leg of Belechu. But Belechu now very sensible. He's maintaining distance here from his adversary and using it to pass the guard. He has to be careful of his leg, however. What he needs to do is pull that knee away from the, the, the lock and the hips of Crocker. So he needs to get, sneak his knee out of that position. Crocker looking for the foot lock, straightens his leg out to Belechu. And the corner calling, and you heard them say clearly to Crocker, yes, now, yes. And they let you now on the bottom, and he really needs to get his knee, you can see from the camera angle, his knee close to the hips of Crocker. He needs to pull that out of there, place his foot on the rear end of Crocker, and explode like a sprinter would out of a block. But again, tactically, Crocker did the right thing when he was under pressure. Belletio has his moments, and Crocker responds well, doesn't he, Dean? Yeah, Crocker's continuously attacking, and he's got a very tight lock, the triangle lock there, on the leg. And what's important, again, is the lock is below the knee. As soon as the knee pops out of that lock, Belletio can get out of that position. He looks to his own corner calmly, though, Belletio, for advice from the opposite end of the cage here. Finger four foot lock, Belletio looking to strip the arms. Working the body shots, nice punches to the head there. Crocker looking to ignore those as he continues his work. You can hear the corner of Crocker very vocal in their instructions. Well, very experienced men, Nigel and Chris, being in the game at the highest level. This is interesting to see the footlocks here, and they're actually enabling the position and the strikes from the back. It's very, very interesting to watch here. And, oh, some big punches there from Bletchley. Crocker felt the second of those rights. Now he's putting the right into the midsection as well. Bletchley a little bit Time. frustrated that he got locked into this position towards the end of that round. You can see from his face, and he was pounding those punches to the body and the head, but he was frustrated to be in that position. It's going to be interesting to see for the judges, because as you said, that frustration, you could, you could see it written all over his face. And he had his moments, but Crocker set out his stall right from the opening round, didn't he, Dean? This was going to ground, and he was going to test Belletiu on the ground for as long as he could. And that was a smart play. I mean, stick to what you're good at. Crocker is an excellent grappler, put a lot of time in that realm to, to be proficient at it. And um, it showed in this fight, he did a great job of, of driving forward, working for the takedown, staying heavy on top and staying out of submissions. He got swept a couple of times, you know, so he, he was kind of giving his weight a little bit too much to Belletiu, but Belletiu just couldn't stay on top. He did a great job. That's what I was going to say, Dean. When he got swept, for you, should Belletiu have maybe capitalised a bit more? You said he couldn't stay on top. For him to win this, should he have capitalised that bit more, do you think? Yeah, he should have passed the guard. He controlled the legs, but it was Crocker that brought his knees up, knees up to his, his head. And imagine he wants to shield his whole body with his, his forearms and his shins to stop the advance. Well, Ricky's coming in for the official announcement. We feel that Crocker will take this, but it's up to three judges at ringside to decide officially. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of action, we've had a go for the judges' scorecards. The judges scored about 29-28, 30-27, and 29-28. All three in favour of your winner by unanimous decision. In the blue corner, representing the United Yes, right, Crocker. And I think that judging spot on as they have been today, Dean. Good judging today, and Crocker goes forward in a very close technical bout, possibly the most technical bout of the day so far for us. Yeah, his ability to implement his game plan, stay on top, use what he's good at, while staying safe out of submission, very impressive, and a very smart, tactful decision to advance forward into this tournament and conserve his energy and limit injuries.
but from the replay here, the handiwork of Crocker. It's a nice hammer fist, and there the takedown look. And you can see immediately that Belechu is, is too eager to grab round the body of his adversary, thus pulling him on top of him with that massive hammer fist here, getting through. And there was that turnaround that you felt Belechu really needed to capitalize on here. And this is what frustrated him, and for, for you possibly, ground out the win. Very, yeah, I mean, it's a very important position to be in. And what the most thing you'd look at was the control. He's controlling his adversary there on, onto the ground, not letting him move and advance into a better position. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome your next fighter into the cage, representing Austria, Georgia Daniel. We are in the lightweight division, Shorda Daniel from Austria. And the lightweight division at this tournament, pretty stacked, Dean. There's a lot of talent here coming through. And, I mean, don't forget, these are the optimum people from the country. These are the best in the country that are coming to the IMAF to compete against each other. So these are really, really the cream of the crop from their respective countries. And that, as we said, the lightweight, a particularly strong division at this tournament, Dean. Yeah, I mean, there's, there's guys like Vitaly Odorodja, oh God, I can't say the name, Odorodjevic uh, from Belarus, you know, world number four in, in that category. There's some, some excellent names coming through there. Um, so they've got their work cut out, and it'll be interesting to see the game plan. Are they going to uh, try and kind of conserve and use the ground game to stay on top and make their opponent work and edge out the decision and then be more explosive in the later rounds? We'll, we'll find out. And please welcome his opponent, representing the United Kingdom, Scott Pedersen. And Scott Pedersen, his opponent here from the United Kingdom at lightweight division. And Scott, I've seen before with Chris Reese, very explosive fighter. And Nigel was talking to us before the tournament today and said they've got high hopes for Scott in this lightweight division. In fact, they were saying they feel he's one of the favorites on form. Yeah, technically um, powerful, everything this guy brings to the table. He, he's, he's a specimen to watch. Don't take your eyes off this one. He comes in with such an extensive uh, grappling background and he couples that with the striking brilliantly. Yes, I said I've, I've been lucky enough to commentate on some of Scott's amateur bouts over the last year. And you're right, Dean, he, he's, a, he's a very exciting young man to watch. And as you mentioned, with that grappling, what comes with that? He's incredibly strong. He's got that grind them out type of style and it, the, kind of the hidden grappler strength inside the core that really controls his opponents. And you mentioned that grinding style. That's what um, Chris Reese, the academy, a lot of his fighters become well known for. And we've got um, Brett Johns there as well in, in, in his team. And so we'll be a training partner of Scott Pedersen. Yes, you know, he's been, he's been in every position and under somebody who is more controlling than he is. So that gives you the affordance to be like, you know what, this guy's doing this to me, I'm gonna do that to my opponent. So it really it opens up to the technicality and, and the hidden, the kind of the, the Jedi grappling, I call it. Because, you, I mean, you could watch it against the cage and think, well, what are they actually doing? But unless you feel it, somebody controlling you and shutting you off and closing you down, it's really like swimming in a swimming pool when you can't swim. Um, so, you know, the, the grappling realm is, is something that, that everybody should taste and taste extensively because if you can dictate the fight to the ground and be very dominant, you can control the fight. Final preparations outside the cage for Scott. Just getting some adjustments here, waiting for Scott to enter the cage. And we're at the IMF European Championships 2018, Bucharest, Romania. Currently waiting for the lightweight fight to get underway. And the bar's been set high, let's be honest, for the opening day. We've, we've already had some incredible encounters. and. We, we were saying the one thing that really stands out is the skill level that we've seen already, the tactical changes, the awareness, the ability of these young men. Yeah, this is what we're talking about with regards to the elite fighters of the country coming forward to fight for their country. So Scott is now in the cage. Ladies and gentlemen, this is a lightweight contest 
opponent of a free three minute rounds. And in the blue corner, representing Austria, Shortje Daniel. And his opponent fighting out of the red corner, representing the United Kingdom, Scott Pedersen. Your referee in charge of the action, Mr. Simone Spignola. Three three-minute rounds in the lightweight division. Shorde Daniel, Austria in the blue. Scott Pedersen, United Kingdom, on form. One of the pre-tournament favourites for this lightweight division. And Scott coming in nice and tight with the boxing. We talk about the grappling, but Chris Rees, they're well-rounded, his guys. And Scott already boxing sweetly here as he comes forward. Pedersen with nice head movement. A very illustrious jab that he uses to set up his combinations whilst moving forward and of course he changes levels when you least expect it whilst advancing forward with the striking this is the thing but i must say a nice sweet jab as well from daniel that's got through the channel a couple of times nice head movement from him nicely balanced scott comes through with those left and rights asking questions daniel answers with his own punches blinks there from that left from scott Pedersen finding a home for that right hand. He does a great job of parrying the punches of his opponents. He'll just knock down the punch. There we go, a nice slip. And just elude those punches and return fire. Yes, he said, as you said, the right hand, the eye catching one at the moment. And that left suddenly comes through to the chin. That was a good strike. Do you know what? Short A Daniel took that well, Dean. Daniel now looking for a way in. He's to set that up with the jab. Perhaps even work the leg kicks here. Nice uppercut from Pedersen. He's got him hurt, going to the body, and there we go, there's the level change and the, the kind of shift to the takedown. He's using the head pressure there up against the cage. He's going to look to perhaps secure the leg or even the underhooks in this position. Now this is the thing you said, Dean, about the unpredictability of Scott, which makes him so dangerous. A lot of coaches and a lot of fighters have said, keep it upright, look how well you're doing, working the body. But he's so comfortable and confident wherever he takes it. He really does bring all the tools in the toolbox to the MMA world. And we're see him, seeing him, he's looking to open up from the knees in this position. He'll say to me that he wants to drop down and attack the legs. There we go, he drops down looking for the single leg. Potentially the high crotch in this position. He's going to look to load his legs up, pull his arms up and around. There we go. Oh, some excellent takedown defense from Daniel, however. I've been impressed with Daniel throughout because I said even defensively when Scott was coming forward with the heavy punches, there was nice defensive head movement and solid boxing in return from Daniel. But as you said, Dean, and we must keep alluding to it, these are the best in the country. This is what the IMAFs is all about. He's not just fighting an Austrian fighter, he's fighting a man that's been chosen to represent his country there. Such a prestigious honor. That equally heavy weight on the shoulders, but at this present time, Daniel's doing a great job of being defensive in every position, off his back, up against the cage. You can see here he's using his feet to make distance. He's going to look to try and stand up. Time. So the end of round one, Dean. And an interesting bout, I, I feel that, as you said, Shorter Daniel, very good defensively, but it was Scott Pedersen that really forced the pace and decided, dictated, if you like, where it went. Yeah, I mean, this is to his skill set. He's, he's excellent in all areas. and we, we can, He shows that he can dictate where he wants to be and advance in that position. And I think he wanted to kind of taste what, what Daniel had in, um, in the striking realm and the grappling realm. And that really just gives him an affordance for his confidence to boost and come out now in the second round and look to finish. Two of three here in the lightweight division. Shorde Daniel, the blue corner from Austria. Scott Pedersen from the United Kingdom in the red. And again, working behind that stiff jab, low kick. And he's so nicely balanced as well, upright, Dean. 
Pedersen looking to set that right hand up. He's using that lead inside leg kick to dis disrupt the balance of Daniel. And there's the right hand. He's trying, to, he's trying to land that. He's setting that up with the jab nicely. Nice body shot to, to the midsection there. Again with the right hand. Switches stances. Looking for the body kick. Yeah, the left hand was dangerously well. It clipped the right hand side of the face of Daniel. And Daniel under pressure here in the second. Daniel using some more kind of correct movement. He's circling off, he's pivoting. He needs to get his back off the cage, however. And there we go. He uses lateral movement. Yes, Pedersen walking him down. And as you said, switching orthodox to southpaw naturally. And there's two reasons you switch from southpaw to orthodox. One, you don't know what you're doing. Or two, you know exactly what you're doing. And it's the latter with Scott Pedersen. Knows exactly what he's doing to keep asking questions of his opponent to get to where he wants to be. He struck just enough to time that slip and then secured that takedown, the knee tap takedown. Now he finds himself looking to pass half guard. And using the knee slice to get through, but Daniel did a great job of securing the half guard again, using the knee shield in this position to gain some distance from his opponent. Yes, defensively, I've been impressed with Shorty Daniel. The only problem for him across this bout is the way that it, his opponents dictated the range where it's been fought. He's obviously a very good competitor, very competent defensively, and a good striker, as we've seen. But he's up against a man who said, this is where we're going to go now, this is where we're going to go now, and he hasn't been able to prevent that. That's, for me, been the defining factor across these two rounds. And this is what we spoke about earlier on before the fight happened, is that the hidden ability and strength, the core strength that you get from grappling for so long, the ability to control somebody, and it's like they're trying to swim, but they just can't stay afloat. And again, we talk about that control. It's there for Scott Pedersen here in the red corner, possibly one of the favourites for this lightweight division. And Dean, you mentioned that grinding style, and we're seeing it here. Yeah, you can see the shoulder pressure here, just off camera from the right arm of Pedersen. He's using, it's called a shoulder of doom. You drive that shoulder into the face, force your opponent to turn away, but now he's firing the punches down. These are landing. Yes, they're all landing cleanly right through the channels here. And with the last 10 seconds of this round, it's been another difficult round for Shorde Daniel from Austria in the blue corner. He hasn't been allowed to get any offensive momentum. Time. He's really been, just been shut off by Pedersen in every direction. And Pedersen timing the takedown and dictating when he takes him down. And Daniel has really got to do something decisive in this next round. So, Dean, in one respect, it's easier said than done because Scott Pedersen, his decision-making is the factor for me as we watch this round. And there was that little slip. You see there, he just hugs the leg, circles off gets the takedown and, and he really he was waiting for that ample opportunity as soon as he saw it he took it and now we can see the, the ground and pound work and immediately controls the head with the shoulder of doom to stop his opponent escaping and then throws the more right hands and, and when we look at that we're looking at eight nine ten punches of which probably 95 96 percent of them landed cleanly as well tough customer here Shorty daniel austria but he's he's dancing to this man's tune at the moment that's the problem for him yeah, he's got to do something out of the box. Spinning back fist, he's got to use some unorthodox techniques. And when he sprawls, he needs to dig the underhooks and circle off. Third and final round of this lightweight encounter. Shorty Daniel Austria in the blue, Scott Pedersen, United Kingdom in the red, who we feel is controlled at the two opening rounds. And if he does nothing stupid here, we'll go through in quite emphatic fashion from those opening two rounds. Yeah, thus far, it's been a clean decision and a kind of, oh, beautiful uppercut. Great boxing skills yeah, from such Pedersen. Such a clean progression of a performance from Pedersen. Looking to set the right hand uppercut, use it to change, oh, beautiful takedown. That's almost been a trademark in this bout, that right hand to the midsection to set up the takedown. And, and it's a winner, isn't it? Because it lands cleanly. It's a good shot on its own. Yeah, he's using that to lift the chin up of his adversary in Daniel. And you can lift the chin up to strike it again. You can lift the chin up so you can duck underneath, get below the hips and obtain the takedown. It's exactly what Pedersen did. And again, when you're looking at tactics, those heavy punches for the ground and pound from Pedersen, he's also keeping himself 
safe, he's unmarked, he's, he's worked well, he's worked, I feel, within himself, comfortably thinking about the tournament situation. Daniel went to stand up there, and Pedersen immediately head him off, and then chooses him to stand up. It's just controlled aggression here, and tactful advances from Pedersen. But that is a case in point. It's also about control, full stop. He's saying, look, I'm telling you where and when it's going to happen. Yeah, stand up now. That's a, I mean, that, that comes into the psychological realm as, realm as well. He's breaking Daniel down physically and psychologically. Yes, it's a commanding performance from Scott Pedersen. And as I said, one of the pre-tournament favorites. And, and quite rightly showing us why at the moment. Those knees blistering through the midsection. And he grimaces Daniel there. You can't keep taking those. Daniel now working the overhook and one underhook. Being used to funnel his arm, his left arm in underneath to get underhooks. Oh, he's eating these knees up. Big body punches again from Pedersen. Choosing to go upstairs with the left hook. Drops down for the level change. Big takedown. Stays away from the guillotine as well. Very impressive takedown from Pedersen. And that's been the problem for Daniel. Everything he's done has been impressive. The timing, the decision-making, where and when. He's shown good control upright. He's shown good skills upright. And then when he decides to take it to ground, it goes to ground. Daniel now more active. He's chasing things a little bit more on the feet and on the ground. He's looking for the, the hip twist, the, the arm bars. He's really looking to finish this fight. He senses that he's got to do something decisively to take this. Well, it will have to be a submission, I feel, now, because um, Scott Pedersen has been in co total control of this lightweight bout. And the clock is ticking for sure, day Daniel, from Austria. That's the last 10 seconds. And barring a disaster, this is a very comprehensive victory for Scott Pedersen. And on this time, one, rightly, one of the contenders for this title. He's going to go most of the way, if not all the way here. Keep your eyes on Scott Pedersen. He is the real deal. And body language again says it all. So, Dean, when we look at the quality of the performance, for me, it was that one word, control. Yeah, it was the controlled aggression, the controlled tactics, everything you could put under the umbrella of the word control is Pedersen. And it's just his ability to, to soak up all the information in the gym and utilize it in the cage. It's so impressive to watch, to stay calm under fire. And of course, for him, this first fight, he wants to advance to the next section without any injuries, without any kind of um, endurance issues, and he did that very smartly. And we mentioned again the, the ground game, the grinding ability, the Chris Reese Academy, the way they do things. But his upright skills were so impressive as well. His balance, his timing, and his combinations, short, sharp, straight punches. They wouldn't have looked out of place in a boxing ring. Yeah, very crisp boxing, particularly the uppercut. And his ability to go from the head to the body and the, the straight right to the body was beautiful. And again, if we, we, which I think we will when we get the official result, see this young man later in the tournament, that straight right to the body as a devastating setup for that takedown. Yeah, you can't explain it. If you get hit to the body, it sucks all the air out, messes with your diaphragm, particularly if you get hit from in the liver, it just drops, guys. I mean, and, and what's it really, like, it really exciting is that Pedersen is going to open up like a flower. He's going to show even more skills later on in the fight. He's going to conserve his energy right now. Um, he's going to even conserve his skills because his adversaries are watching, you best believe it. So he's going to come, come to um, a different light here in the later fights. Ladies and gentlemen, after three rounds of action, we've had to go to the judges' scorecards. The judges scored about 30-27, 30-25, and 30-27. All three in favour of your winner by unanimous decision. In the red corner, representing United Kingdom, Scott Pedersen. Very clear scoring, comprehensive margin, and rightly so. It was possibly the most dominant performance of the day here at IMAF. Incredible stuff. Great opening sets of contesting with so many different things to talk about. And then to finish it, a comprehensive performance, upright and on the ground from a very talented lightweight. Yeah, and let's face it, uh, one of the favourites. And now most of his skills have been out there. He's been in the cage, he's tasted it, he's got the jitters away. Now he's going to look to advance. You can see the handiwork here, the beautiful jab. 
his circular movement, that slip was just perfectly timed into the knee tap takedown. It lands up on top and controls the head. And here we see some of the ground and pound from Pedersen. Nice uppercut left hook to the leg kick. Just a full range of techniques here being displayed by Scott. Well, that's the scary thing, Dean, the upright ability as well. We know his ability on the ground. We know his strength on the ground, how he can keep the cardio going on the ground, and a fantastic result to end this opening day. Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes our first day of fighting. Please join us tomorrow at 11 o'clock, right here for day two of the IMF European Championships. Can all officials meet with Mark Goddard at the back of the room for the official debriefing? Once again, see you all tomorrow. Thank you for coming out today.